if we can know that the church of our Lord that was built 2,000 years ago, if it's still around today. And of course, we showed that it is, but we're not through showing it yet. We're going to look at some things tonight. Tonight's kind of an addenda to this morning's lesson. You know, we, we was talking about a pattern and how that patterns are closely followed. Let's say the year is 2784. They're doing some excavation around this place that used to be called Irving. And they find this great arena, odd-shaped thing. It was something that they had not experienced before. And as they began to unearth this arena, they uncovered a little booklet. The rules of baseball. So they decided, you know what? Let's let's give it a try. Let's see if we going if we we'll like it. They played that so many years ago. Let's see what they got out of it. They opened up the little booklet. It had all the rules of play. Ninety foot to the bases. The outfield and the in the infield division. The diamond shape of the infield. Nine players. Referees, the whole works. As they begin to read, they begin to implement the things they read. Aside, perhaps, of the shape of the bats, because really there wasn't anything on that, they begin to play this game called baseball. The question is, would it be like the game of baseball we play today? If they followed every rule, the answer is yes. If it's true with baseball, why isn't it true about the church and the Bible? If we follow everything that the Bible tells us about the New Testament church, then what do you have? The New Testament church. Tonight we're going to look at a tale of two kingdoms and discuss some things I think is going to be hopefully interesting to you. Next week, next Sunday morning, I'm going to deal with the question, is the church essential? Is the church essential? That's really where this is leading up to. But you have to have the background story of the church before you can appreciate the nature of the church. Now, I'm going to start all the way back in the Old Testament. You know, we talked about a few weeks ago about how that uh, uh, the Bible is basically divided into three different groups. To rightly divide that, we have to recognize those three groups. First of all, there is the patriarchal period, the period where the fathers intervene between the family and God, and they offered sacrifices for the family, like Job chapter 1. We're going to go back even further than that. We're going to go back to the Garden of Eden. You see, the whole fabric of the plan of salvation begins in Genesis 3, verse 15, where the woman is told that her heel would bruise the head of the serpent, Satan. That was exactly what was going to happen thousands of years later through Jesus Christ. He would be injured to the point of death. But yet, his destruction of the flesh would lead to the destruction of the power of Satan. And of course, it would end in our salvation if we believe in him and if we obey him. We will go forward to Genesis 12, to the promise. And this is where we're going to get into the parable, or the, the uh, a tale of two kingdoms. We rush through some of these studies and, and we kind of miss a few things and I hope I bring some things up that maybe we need to consider that we haven't. First of all, when Abraham received this promise, he was 
the intervention between God and his family. This is the patriarchal period. So now it's during this time that God, through angels, appeared to him and said that he would be the father of a great nation. And then he added, all nations of the earth would be blessed. On this little diagram, I've got two divisions. The first division is the great nation. You see, they are intertwined together because it would be the great nation from whence the all nations of the earth would be blessed. So they're really intertwined, but they were separated up to the time of the cross. Now, the first promise was of a national na uh, flavor, and it would be temporary. All nations, or excuse me, the uh, great nation was only a temporary promise. We need to understand that. That's why there's a lot of confusion today about Israel. The promise does not no longer apply in the religious world. Israel has served her purpose as God's people. But now it's changed. We're in a whole different timetable. We're in the Christian dispensation. In the Christian dispensation, the law has changed. In Galatians 3, we find that the law brought us to Christ. But after Christ has come, we're no longer under the law, under that tutor. So therefore, the work of the law, as well as the work of God's people, is finished. Now we're under a different kingdom. It's the international kingdom. And everything that we read about this kingdom is it's eternal. It's not just temporary. It is an eternal kingdom. Open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 3. While you're turning there, I want to read a passage out of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 18. This statement was made to Moses. Now listen to what God told Moses. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I command him. Who is he talking about? Christ. He would be a prophet like unto Moses. But it's going to be different because no longer are they listening to Moses. Now they're going to listen to Christ. You remember the Mount of Transfiguration? What God said? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You listen to him. Here in Deuteronomy 18, he says, I will put my commands in his mouth. You will hear him. And this shall be whoever will not hear my words, which he spake in my name, I will require it of him. This prophet is Jesus Christ. The words that he commands are the words of God. Hebrews talks about a division in the house. You have the son and you have the servant. Moses was a servant. But which is greater, the servant or the son? Well, the, ser the son. Who listens to who? Well, the servant listens to the son. So in the kingdom of God, who is the head? We talked about that this morning. That would be Christ as the son. With that in mind, I want us to look at these two passages. Ephesians chapter 3. Because we're going to talk about the prophets of old. Can you imagine being a prophet of God? First of all, in Deuteronomy 18, it says, How do you know if a prophet is from God? When the things that he prophesies come to pass. That's how you know. Makes sense, doesn't it? A false prophet, when he makes a prophecy, it won't happen. It won't come to pass because God didn't uh, reveal it to him. 
Now I want you to think about these prophets and their work. I want you to think about the kingdom. The prophecies of the Old Testament dealt in two areas specifically. Number one, the coming of the Messiah. Number two, the coming of the kingdom. There were other prophecies made, but there were residual prophecies around those two. The prophecy of the coming king and the coming kingdom. Now, let's look at Ephesians 3, chapter 2. Uh, verse 2, excuse me. If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation, underline that, revelation, how did Paul know by revelation? How was it given to him by revelation? He made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. How is that? Through revelation. Which in other ages was not made. Through these other dispensations of time, patriarchal, mosaical, it wasn't made known to them. As it has now been revealed through the Spirit and the prophets. It's now been revealed through the Spirit and the prophets. Remember what Jesus prayed about for the disciples? That when the Spirit has come, He would guide them into what? All the truth. The Spirit would reveal them all things pertaining to their work and to the kingdom. Now, Skip down to verse 9. Ephesians 3, verse 9. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God. They didn't know what God was doing. They had no way of understanding what God was doing. They didn't understand the prophecies. They couldn't. It was in the mind of God and the thought of God. But understand this. God knew exactly what He was doing every moment along the way. To the point of the death of Jesus Christ, God knew what He was doing. Who created all things through Jesus Christ with the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be known by the church. The church, part of our job is to let men know the manifold wisdom of God in the plan of salvation. To the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose. Since the beginning of time, this was God's purpose to number one, send His Son with the plan of salvation, number two, to establish the eternal kingdom. That was always God's plan. He never deferred one time from that plan. He never changed his mind one time when it comes to this plan. Which is accomplished in the Lord Jesus our Lord. It's Christ Jesus our Lord. Now look at 1 Peter 1 verse 10. 10 through 12. 1 Peter 1, verses 10 through 12. Once again, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. You know, don't you know there had to be a lot of question marks in their mind? What does all this mean? Well, think about this. You studied Revelation. Sometimes you get kind of searching it and you look into it, you get confused. That's because perhaps you don't understand the prophecies. Or you don't understand the symbols. 
Here, they didn't understand what God was revealing to them. They searched. They had the questions, but they didn't have any answers. Now, let's go on. Who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who is in them was indicated when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. You see, that was the plan from the very beginning. Do you get it? That was the plan. That was what the prophecy is all about. Just read Isaiah 53. To them it was revealed that, watch this, not to themselves, but to us. They were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven. Things which even the angels desire to look into. Think about that. The angels didn't even understand what God was doing. Don't you know there's some confusion in heaven whenever the Son of God came to this earth? They didn't know what was happening. They didn't understand the plan. The prophets didn't understand the plan. But in that manger outside of Bethlehem that night, when Jesus Christ was born, that plan was beginning to unveil itself. Again, I want to add something. What we don't think about is not only the plan of Jesus Christ coming about, but also the plan for the New Testament church was in the process of being revealed. and all surrounded by Jesus. That makes the church significant, doesn't it? As we talked about this morning, Jesus is the head. The church is the body. We are the members. Don't you know it breaks the heart of Jesus to hear someone say, the church isn't important. I can go to heaven without the church. I may be a tad into next week's lesson, but forgive me. That means to a lot of people, the church isn't essential. I don't care what a lot of people think. I want to know what the Bible says. I, we'll look at that next week. But I think we know the answer to that. I think it's pretty, pretty much revealed in truth. When you ask that question, or when you make that statement that the church isn't essential, it isn't important. In a lot of what we've talked about today even. I've been all preaching here and forgot to move the same. All right. How can we recognize the New Testament church? Out of the thousands of denominations that's in our globe, how do we recognize the one church? Well, I promise you, if you listen to what a man says, you're not going to be able to figure it out. That's why there's over 45,000 global denominations today because men are turning to the wrong resources. I'm still appalled at the fact that someone just out of, the, out, of the, out of the blue can start their own denomination, but it happens all the time. It doesn't take much. It's just a name. And you've got a denomination. 45,000. Now how do you find the church that Jesus Christ died for, that he had built out of that 45,000? Well, the first thing we've got to realize is it's what the prophets prophesied. <laughs> You know, when I was a young preacher boy, I was told one time by an older member, son, you shouldn't preach from the Old Testament. I couldn't believe my ears. We're not under the Old Testament anymore. So you shouldn't preach from it. I'm going to tell you the truth about that right there. The truth of that is, you can't understand the New Testament until you have a proper understanding of the Old Testament. Try to read Hebrews without an understanding of the Old Testament. Or even Revelation. 
or the Gospels, especially Matthew. I don't believe we've spent enough time in the Old Testament to truly understand what these prophets were saying and to look at the prophecies and then watch those prophets being or prophecies being revealed in the New Testament. In St. Peter 1 verse 20, knowing this verse that no prophecy came from one's personal or private interpretation of Scripture. It didn't happen that way. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That makes what that prophet said different than any other man. Because he was being moved by the Spirit of God. Now, when you look at some of these prophecies, and you apply them to the New Testament, it gets interesting. The law, for example. The Bible tells us that the law was given to bring us unto Christ. It was our schoolmaster. And by the way, Moses was not only a prophet, he was a lawgiver, right? He gave us the law. He gave the Jews the law. Jesus himself is also a lawgiver. The new law, the new covenant, as, as the writer wrote in Hebrews. He is a prophet, and he is also a lawgiver, like Moses was. Except his law is eternal. Until the end of time, we'll obey in his law. So he too is a lawgiver. You know, I mentioned this this morning. I want to repeat it again. The church is not a democracy. It's not left up to us to decide what we're going to believe or not believe. That's already been predetermined by God. We are a monarchy. We are a kingdom, and that's what I'm talking about. We're a kingdom. A kingdom has a king, a sovereign king. And it's the king's will that we must do. Jesus not only is a prophet and our Lord, he is our king as well as lawgiver. And the law brought us, brought the Jews to the person of Christ and prepared the way for him. John the Baptist prepared the way. Matthew 3 verse 1. In those days John came preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Does John the Baptist say repent for the kingdom of heaven is 3,000 years down the road? He said repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know why he said that? The same reason why Jesus preached the same thing. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The same reason why Jesus would say in Mark the ninth chapter verse 1 that many of you will not taste of death until you see the kingdom come with power. There were some folks still alive that heard his preaching whenever the kingdom come. Now, either there's some really old rascals out there or the kingdom was established a long time prior to 2024. And we know it's the latter. It was established during the life of those individuals that Jesus preached to. There's not a doubt in my mind that maybe some of those people who Jesus preached to in his ministry ended up obeying the gospel in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. I believe that. Out of that 3,000, some had heard him in his ministry, but yet rejected him on the day of Pentecost. I believe that. Now, 
Now, for a little bit of time, I want to look at Daniel. The eternal kingdom. So, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Couldn't even remember the dream, so he brought in the magicians and satraps and all of his wise men and said, okay, tell me this dream. I don't remember it, but it bothered me. We can't interpret it if we don't know the dream. Well, you're going to die. They called Daniel. Daniel prayed. The Lord gave Daniel that dream. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, here's the dream. There was a great image. It had a head of gold, arms and chest of silver, bronze thighs, legs and feet of mixed iron and clay. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the gold head. You are the majestic king. There will be lesser kingdoms that will come after you. There will be the Medes and the Persians. Of course, he didn't say this, but that's who it was, we know. If you follow history. Then you'll have the Grecians. And then you'll have the Romans. Now, in the days of these kings, that the feet of the great image, this stone will hit. And it will break to pieces all that kingdom and it will consume the whole earth now look, listen at Daniel 2 you got your Bibles turn over to Daniel 2 44 in the days of these kings what kings are we talking about the kings of the Roman Empire when was Jesus born in the days of the Roman Empire when did Jesus die during the days of the Roman Empire when was the day of Pentecost and the church was established? In the days of the Roman Empire. Notice, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which, watch this, shall never be destroyed. You can't destroy it. It is indestructible. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. No one can take it over. No one can conquer it. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And once again, he says, it shall stand forever. We talked about this morning, the seed being the word of God. There's no way it can be destroyed. No way. It will always exist. Even if we got wiped off the face of the earth, it will always exist in the word. And I believe it will always exist even on the face of the earth. Now, Daniel said it would be the days of the Roman Empire that these, this kingdom will be established. Once it's established, it will stand forever. So we have a time frame now. So the kingdom will be established during the time of the Roman Empire. We know that according to this dream. Well, let's go on. Daniel 7, verse 13. Daniel's night vision. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days. Now, who is one like the Son of Man? It's Jesus Christ. Who is the Ancient of Days? Another figure for God. So Jesus is now brought before God. Watch this. And they brought him near and before him. Then to him, the Son of Man was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Who does the kingdom belong to? Christ. That all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. This is the kingdom that Christ shall establish 
and it will be eternal. The interpretation of these dreams together is, first of all, it would happen to the days of Roman Empire. Jesus would approach the ancient of days and receive dominion, glory, and a kingdom. He received an everlasting kingdom, and the kingdom shall last forever. When God presents the kingdom, and we said this morning, Matthew 16, 18, that the kingdom is the church. So when God handed him the church, it will stand forever. When shall these things come to pass? This is going to be my last point for today, for tonight anyway. In Joel 2, verse 28, Joel prophesied that in the last days, I'm always being asked about the last days. Are we in the last days? Well, the answer to that is yes. We are in the last days. Well, when did they start? Well, the last days started in Acts 2. Or we should say at the death of Christ. Now we are in the last, we're in that last dispensation of time. There's not going to be another dispensation. This is it. Everything, those other two dispensations of time, built up to this. So the prophet Joel said, this shall come to pass in the last days. I'll pour my spirit out on all flesh. That began on the Jews in Acts chapter 2. Look at Luke 24, 46. Luke 24, 46. After Jesus' resurrection, shortly before his ascension, listen carefully what he told the apostles. Thus it is written, and thus it is necessary for Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead the third day. Now, now watch this. The repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in that city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Where were they in Acts 1? Waiting in Jerusalem. Why? Jesus told them to. What were they wanting to happen? They wanted to receive that power from on high, the power from God. This was prophesied in Joel chapter 2, and now it's about to come to fruition. Acts chapter 2, it happened. They were all sitting in one place whenever the power of the Holy Spirit fell upon them. They immediately began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Why? So people could understand them. It wasn't gibberish. You can't understand a bunch of gibberish and nonsense like a lot of people think tongue speaking is. You can't edify someone or you can't teach someone with gibberish. It had to be a language that carried the important thoughts of the plan of salvation. There were different nations represented there in Jerusalem. Remember it says all nations. Isaiah 2, Micah 4, all nations shall flow into Jerusalem. And out of Jerusalem the law shall go forth. What? The law. From where? Jerusalem. Jesus is a lawgiver. His law will go out beginning in Jerusalem. The church began where? In Jerusalem. Just like Jesus said it would. Just like the Spirit said it would. Just like the prophets revealed, was revealed to the prophets. And they said it would. Now, as I began to preach in other languages, men began to say, well, you're drunk. 
they say, how can that be when it's just 9 o'clock in the morning? And then they preach. Now remember what Jesus said? Repentance and remission of sins would begin being preached first in Jerusalem. Men and brothers, they cried out after hearing about Jesus. You, by cruel hands, you have crucified the Lord. God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Men and brethren, what must we do? What were they told? Repent and be baptized. Why? For the remission of sins. What Jesus foretold in Luke 24 is now happening in Acts chapter 2. What is happening in Acts chapter 2 was a thing promised to Peter in Matthew 16. The keys of the kingdom is now being used to open the kingdom's doors to all nations. And as I've mentioned before, and we'll continue to look at, the kingdom and the church is one and the same. The kingdom has been established and it began in Jerusalem. Next Sunday we will continue our thoughts answering the question, is the church essential? I could probably stop right now. I think it's pretty evident how I'm going to answer that question, but I'm not. I've got some more material I want to use. As I mentioned earlier, I believe it breaks the heart of the Godhead to hear the way people discuss the church. The way the church has been taken advantage of, treated, even by its own members. I'm sure it breaks the heart of the Godhead to see how people react to the church, his church. That's why we need to be very, very careful. Again, I remind you, Acts 20, 28. Take heed of yourselves, Paul told the Ephesian elders. Take heed of yourselves and of the flock of God over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Feed the church of God. Remember this, folks. Never forget it. Which he has purchased with his own blood. You put down the church, you put down the blood of Christ. You take for granted the church, you take for granted the blood of Christ. As we looked at this morning, the church is intertwined with the precious blood of Jesus. We are blood washed, sanctified, holy, set apart for doing God's will. We are different people. We are a holy priesthood. We are different. We may be in the world, but we are not of the world. We're not a part of the world. We stand apart from the world. We talked about that in Rick's class this morning. We're to shine as beacons in the night. Sometimes our beacons get a little bit dim. We need to let them shine. We've got a job to do. That's to glorify God through the church, Ephesians 3.21. That's to glorify God through our actions, through our influence. I would encourage us to take a closer examination as we look at the body of Christ, the church, the kingdom. Is it essential? You better believe it. And we'll answer that next week. Tonight, if you need to come and be baptized for the mystery of sins, as they were on the day of Acts chapter 2, then we encourage you to do so. If you are have been unfaithful and not true to the calling, then you need to come. Why don't you do so while we stand and sing together?